So with that, I want to say thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is our Variations webinar series, and the theme for our most recent fall, uh, summer edition of Variation was Probing the Past for Keys to the Future. Holly Kilborn is joining us today. She's from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Studies. She's an assistant professor out there. And Hallie was both the chair of our workshop this past summer that we hosted on Boulder, which kind of stymied and stirred the interest for this variation. Um, the workshop was called Connecting Paleo-Modern Oceanographic Data to Understand AMOC Over Decades to Centuries. Um, so she helped us put together that workshop, and then she also served as guest editor for this most recent edition of Variations. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Hallie and say thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, um, Kristen. Um, so yeah, I, I um, led this workshop, and uh, coming out of that workshop, we asked a few of people who were there to uh, contribute to a, a uh, a, an episode of a newsletter uh, variations. Um, so two, the two people who are, were able to join us today are Kausta Thermali at the University of Texas at Austin and Alan Wanamaker at Iowa State University. Um, not able to make it um, are Ulysses uh, Nieneman and, and um, David Thernally um, did another um, article, and I'll actually be highlighting a little bit of, of their work um, in my own, in my own um, sort of uh, comments here. So um, I think actually if we just start the PowerPoint, um, I can – so this, like, like Kristen said, we, we really started this um, with a workshop, and my motivation for trying to organize this workshop is basically two fundamental scientific questions, and, and that is, are multi-decadal scale variations in the North Atlantic sea surface temperature caused by changes in deep overturning of the ocean? So is AMOC related to AMO, AMV, um, and, um, and, and how? Because we, we think that on geologic timescales, there's evidence that the two are related, but on, once you get down to finer timescales, um, the dynamics change, and we, and we want to un understand the, the more recent um, variability. So then, then following from that is then how are both of these related to other aspects of the Earth system that, that are sort of societally important, and um, we care where it rains, when it rains, whether or not there's big tropical storms, how ecosystems function, um, because we are a part of those ecosystems and we depend on them. So, so those, that's really what drove uh, the, sort of the, the my interest in in um, in making this this workshop. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, but but fundamentally, um, the to answer these these questions, um, we need um, there are certain data requirements, and and coming out, I, I wanted to describe to you, to the audience here, sort of my perspective on on these issues. Um, so basically, if you want to get at multi-decadal uh, multi variability, you have to have records that are multiple centuries long. They have to have decadal or better, better temporal resolution. Ideally, you, we need to know what sea surface temperatures we're doing, because the fundamental question is, what, are, what is the relationship between sea surface temperature in the Atlantic and overturning circulation. We also need a record of over overturning circulation, or some proxy thereof. Um, and then, obviously, if we're interested in other variables, then we have to have long records, similar records of those variables. Um, well, so next slide. Oops, something's wrong. Let's – okay, yeah. Um, so I guess, actually, let's, let's look at what, what these requirements are. So um, the basic – premise is that our instrumental records are too short. Here's an example of SST data. Um, this is COADS data, um, just um, sort of demonstrating this, this lack of, of, um, of data in terms of multi-century long records. So we need, we need our, our geologic archives. Next slide. So the, oh, wait, wait, back. 
So the problem with decadal, uh, with, with geologic archives, is this decadal or better resolution. Okay, now, now go. Ahead. Um, and so here's here's just a really rough estimate of looking at um, the amount of sediment that is being deposited on the seafloor. Um, so this is actually a map of sediment thickness in meters, which is actually, I mean, it's huge in terms of the thickness uh, of sediment. But the problem is, is actually sedimentation rates. Um, so normal ocean sed sedimentation rates are in the sort of, in, for most of the ocean, 1 to 5 millimeters per thousand years, and high, high values might be 10, 10 millimeters per thousand years. Um, so these, we are limited in terms of where we can go to, to the geologic archives in order to get records that have enough material to in the in the marine realm, um, where you can actually get at decadal and better resolution, and so the areas along the coasts where you've got red, orange, and yellow, those are going to be your your major um, areas where you have higher sedimentation rates, and you're able to get the temporal resolution that we require for this question. Um, so that is going to sort of limit where we can go. And um, next slide. So uh, essentially what we need to do is look at high deposition rate marine archives for this question. So we can, we can find places in the ocean where the sediment um, records are high resolution and ideally annually laminated, but that's very, very rare. Um, we can go to uh, biogenic carbonates like sclerotinian corals or long-lived bivalves. They can provide uh, multi-century long records with annual and subannual resolution. So that's why these proxies are really valuable. But again, they're going to be found in the coastal zone. Um, so that's that's or or at least in the in the shallow shelf, um, shallower shelf areas rather than in the deep ocean. Um, so another uh, next slide. The ne another um, sort of deposit that can give us this sort of of high temporal resolution that we need are sediment drift deposits. Um, and so this, um, this, the, the map on the top left shows with the dashed arrows, um, shows sort of major deep water um, currents that flow along the contours. And the bottom map, map picture there um, shows um, in gray these, these uh, sediment drift deposits that are essentially uh, deposited um, as a result of these, these circulation patterns. Um, now, the, this happens to be um, a, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the author's name. I want him to give a shout out. This is, this is a paper, um, not my work, um, that showed the, um, sort of how these drift deposits, the, the sedimentary structure of these drift deposits. Um, and so we have seismic lines along those black lines in the lower, in the map, the lower map there, and actually both maps. Um, and on the right, we see the actual data from the seismic uh, lines where uh, that's been interpreted showing the, the drift deposits. Um, and the middle deposit is called the Bjorn drift. Um, and the, that's um, that's over on in the center large gray um, gray area um, in the map. Uh, next slide. If you zoom in on the Bjorn drift deposit, we can get an idea of um, the sort of sedimentation rates we're talking about. So um, so for for this this site, we have an ODP drill core where we have good dating. And so we know that the top 100 meters here um, is represented in that, the yellow strata. Uh, and that's approximately 1 million years of sediment. So we have accumulation rates on the order of a millimeter for every 10 years. That begins to actually be able to get at multi-decadal variability. Um, it's tough and takes a lot of work, um, but it's possible to do. Um, you could get, say, 20 year per sample data, um, or, or maybe only 50 year per sample, um, but preferably um, finer. Okay, next slide. 
So besides this temporal resolution issue, um, another issue that we're still working on is trying to reconstruct sea surface temperatures. Um, and that's, that's of course, non-trivial um, because we don't have direct measurements. Go ahead and next slide. Um, and I, I actually, this is an admittedly getting to be an old paper, uh, figure. It was, it was actually published in 2014. Um, but it, it shows an important point that um, not all reconstructions are saying the same thing when they, they, they are trying to reconstruct the same thing. So um, in the bottom, this is a, this is a figure, um, replace AMO with AMV. Um, that was a, an editorial thing that I was forced to do uh, <laughs> because of the editor, not because of my, uh, my own uh, Volition. Um, so, um, so in the top you have the AMV index or AMO index from Enfield um, that's really based on the sea surface temperatures, and then um, I've, then I looked at for this paper in purple reconstructing specifically Caribbean temperatures um, as some subset of that surface field that as an important aspect of the, sur the surface field. But I, what I also want to point out here is I compared that Caribbean composite to a reconstruction that was nominally sea surface temperatures in the North Atlantic, much like the AMO index of, of Enfield. Um, based on tree rings. That was by Gray et al. in 2004. It is the most commonly uh, reused as the history of, of um, Atlantic multidecadal variability. Um, there's another reconstruction from Mann 2009, um, and the two don't match, and neither of them have much to do with the Caribbean um, and the post-instrumental record. Era. So if you look during the, the instrumental record era, sort of to the late 1800s, um, the multidecadal variability in all of these records seemed to be co essentially coeval and in phase and looking, looking very similar. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that we're not there yet with, with our SST reconstructions. Uh, there's some new data that's, that's come out in the intervening time, and, um, but that we need to get better um, sort of reconstructions of, of SST, both for high latitude sites, for low latitude sites, and the entire um, Atlantic SST field rather than, um, uh, and, and do it from marine proxies rather than the tree rings, which Gray and Mann are primarily focusing on. Um, they, have, they have primarily tree rings in those, in those records. So we're, not, we're looking at essentially continental um, climate to reconstruct the oceans, and we have plenty of ocean proxies that are that are, can do it. Um, so next slide. So besides getting an SST field that we're still working on, um, we also need some some measure of the overturning circulation, and um, that can be done in a variety of different ways. And um, so I want to highlight a couple. Um, next slide. With with Paleo proxies of overturning, we are never going to get the um, stream function that we want of MOC. Um, but what we can get are aspects of the flow. Uh, so in here, here, this is actually from um, um, Ulysses Nenemann's um, article in Variations. And he and and he and uh, Cernali summarized the literature very nicely, um, showing the work that's been done to reconstruct the Iceland Scotland overflow water. And so the map at the bottom shows where some of these data come from, uh, the data in the article come from, um, and the the red and the green dots represent the red and the green lines that are estimates of near bottom flow from those those regions, and uh, they compared them with the um, Gray et al. Um, index reconstruction of Atlantic multidecadal variability, uh, showing again in the in the instrumental record sort of era that, that there's generally quite a bit of agreement. Um, the phasing between the um, 
the gray record the, in black, and the, um, the two Iceland-Scotland overflow records can't be um, sort of an, analyzed very, very with, with great um, accuracy because of the fact that there are age model uncertainties that essentially mean that the phase shifts can be within the error and the uncertainty of the records themselves. So, so we can't yet really tie the, the phasing together based on these records, but it's certainly a um, promising uh, start to trying to reconstruct at least this aspect of the circulation. And that's something that, that, I'm, um, I, that came up at the workshop was that we need to be able to physically relate what we can reconstruct with the parameter that we care about of the actual o amount of overturning. Um, and so that's, um, that's something that, that we need to work on in the future. So another, another method of doing uh, these sorts of uh, reconstructing circulation, go ahead and to go to the next slide, is to use tracers. So this is an example um, of work I've done just showing the, the concept that with C14 in the surface ocean, we have some strong gradients between the equatorial Atlantic and the subtropical Atlantic. And in theory, if you can, if you can characterize the C14 signature of waters in the Caribbean that are a mix of the subtropical um, North Atlantic, North Equatorial Current and the equatorial, sort of South Equatorial Current, um, North Brazil Current, and all the, all the eddies going through, um, if the C14 that is in, in the Caribbean is representative of that mixture, you can actually see whether or not there's more cross-equatorial uh, water entering the Caribbean and therefore entering into the Gulf Stream and going northward as part of the northward um, uh, limb, the surface limb of meridional overturning. So, so as a contrast to the deep overturning, um, we have we have a way of getting at shallow overturning, uh, or not shallow, but the shallow, the shallow limb of the overturning. So this is, this is uh, I would say, still the, the, the data from this study that I actually did was more of a proof of concept um, for, for doing such reconstructions. Um, and um, we need to do more of this sort of thing and tie it very, link it very, um, tightly to understanding of the dynamics that drives these signatures. So that's a, that's a way we need to move forward. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's see what I've got. I think that may be the end of this. Yeah, that you had the final. That's the end. OK, yeah. So, so what I wanted to do now is actually highlight um, or, or let, um, let Cowstop and, um, and Al actually explain what, the, what their thoughts on this, this topic are. So. Great. Thanks, Hallie. Any quick clarifications for Hallie before we move on to CalSTEM? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, and we'll take all your questions at the end. So CalSTEM, why don't you go ahead? Hi, are you with us? Make sure you're not on mute. Yeah, I was on mute. Can okay, you great. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Awesome. Uh, hi. Uh, so my name is Kaustub Thirmalai, and uh, I'll be presenting some of the work that, uh, uh, the, or the article that Julie Ritchie and I wrote up in Variations. And uh, so just to kind of build on what uh, Hallie was talking about. So there's been several approaches to try and figure out how uh, Atlantic overturning, uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation changed in the past. And uh, from the proxy approach, typically it's been looking at the stable isotopes, for example, delta 13C and delta 18 O of benthic foraminifera. And for those who are not familiar, foraminifera are just uh, these small unicellular critters that make calcium carbonate shells and live either at the top uh, of the ocean or at the bottom of the ocean. And so workers have exploited uh, uh, their shells chemistry uh, to trace sort of water masses uh, and even looking at things like cadmium calcium ratios or uh, even radiocarbon 14C uh, in foraminifera to look at past circulation changes. 
and I think Alan will talk a little bit more about radiocarbon in other archives. Um, and also, people have looked at neodymium isotopes, which is uh, a sort of a quasi-conservative tracer for uh, water masses, so in actual sediments measuring the neodymium isotopes. And uh, people have also looked at the ratio of protactinium to thorium in the sediments, and this is supposed to be related to scavenging uh, uh, in the ocean, such that it will give you a signature for overturning. And people have also looked at sortable silt proxies. So this is sort of the broad, uh, and I'm, I'm missing some here, of course, but these are some of the uh, major proxies that people use to reconstruct past circulation. Uh, some of the limitations of this is that many of these studies have targeted sort of long-term glacial, interglacial, or sort of millennial scale uh, uh, climate change and ocean circulation changes. And one of the major reasons for this is that we don't have highly resolved sediments, as Howie mentioned, uh, where we can use um, a lot of material to s sort of uh, uh, measure these proxies. And uh, one of the issues becomes, again, that many of these uh, methodologies are quite sediment intensive. So if you don't have fast accumulating sediments, and if your methodology is actually going to use up a lot of sediments to measure the proxies, and you kind of have a problem. So when you're trying to reconstruct decadal to centennial scale changes in circulation, you need to uh, uh, really look at target high resolution sediments or look at different approaches. And furthermore, many of the uh, approaches that have looked at decadal to centennial scale EMAP changes are sort of concentrated in the North Atlantic area, uh, and, and they try to focus on uh, sort of deep water formation as opposed to uh, shallow limb circulation like Hallie mentioned. So anyway, so one potential way to uh, overcome this deficit is by looking at sea surface salinity changes. And so uh, salinity is an indicator of ocean circulation. I don't know if you guys can click that link, but I had a GIF made uh, for you guys. Let me see if I can... Uh, no, I don't think we can click it. Yeah. No worries. I can put it in the chat box right here. So if you guys want to click on it, feel free. It's just right. a simple little GIF I made with reanalysis data of salinity from the ORAS4 data set. And I just put together some random months. And what you can see is that uh, salinity changes, monthly, mean monthly salinity, uh, can tell you a lot about ocean circulation. And so if you're looking at the GIF, you can kind of see uh, several patterns emerge. You can see the subtropical gyres. Uh, you can see equatorial currents. You can see sort of the Gulf Stream as well. And all of these, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's no secret nor surprise that uh, sea surface salinity changes tell you about ocean circulation at the surface. And so when you come back to the mean annual uh, sea surface salinity plot that we have on the screen up here, uh, you can see that um, it, it is quite telling of the mean circulation state of the, of the surface ocean. And so basically, the approach is to try and utilize proxies for salinity to figure out how potentially AMOC might have varied in the past, at least the surface portion of AMOC. And so one approach that we've uh, looked into, uh, this is a little complex, but I'll walk you guys through it. On the left-hand side is uh, uh, the same plot as the, uh, as the previous slide. But one approach that we've looked into is to try and look at uh, long-term salinity changes in both modeling as well as observational data sets and to look at field correlation analysis to figure out whether we can see some coherent patterns or not in the ocean, and whether these sort of disparate regions uh, that provide high sedimentation rates can really contribute towards talking about large-scale Atlantic Ocean circulation. So I'll tell you what I mean by this. So what I have here on the right-hand side is, uh, uh, if, you take, if you look at that box right there, that black, little black box uh, right here, at 26 North, I just chose this box just because it's been used. You know, that's where uh, we have all these measurements of um, overturning. And so I use this box here, 
And what you see here is the correlation coefficient between uh, salinities in this box and salinity at every other grid point in the ocean. And essentially, uh, and, the, and the black dots show significance. And the salinities are not our mean monthly salinities, but what we've done here is to use a 10-year low-pass filter. And all this data comes from the ORAS4 data set. Uh, it's a reanalysis data set, so of course it has limitations and so forth, but you can apply this to your favorite data, salinity data sets or from model output. Uh, and the idea is that you start to see a lot of these patterns emerge. So, uh, for example, you see a, a large, uh, you know, positive correlation swath up here, and then you see more negative correlations and, and significant positive correlations off the coast of Africa over here as well. So, it's a very interesting perspective to figure out how uh, salinity can tell you about circulation changes in the past. So, the approach would be to look at to target areas and time periods where you might uh, uh, putatively assume that AMOC might have varied or surface circulation might have varied or you have changes in the Gulf Stream. For example, the Little Ice Age is considered a time period where uh, there was slowdown of the Gulf Stream and so forth. So if you look at these time periods, you can basically look at uh, these correlation analysis based on instrumental or uh, uh, reanalysis or modeling data and go to these regions, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico or off the coast of Carolina, uh, where you do have really high resolution sedimentation, where you do have the potential to resolve decadal to centennial scale variation. Uh, for example, over here, uh, and you go and basically, if you can build records of paleosalinity from these spots, these disparate areas where you have uh, high sedimentation rates, but they're not necessarily in the active uh, quote unquote active zones of uh, uh, where AMOC matters, you can still piece together insights from these disparate records and talk about large scale Atlantic Ocean circulation. So, if we went into the Little Ice Age and had sediments from all over these places uh, and there was supposed uh, slowdown in circulation, they ought to conform to these maps or to conform to uh, uh, modeling simulations of salinity at that time period. And so, though it's really difficult to get at salinity uh, uh, in terms of a paleoclimate reconstruction, we do know that we can reconstruct the delta ATNO of the seawater. And the delta ATNO of seawater varies as a function of salinity. So, um, this right here is, for example, uh, a GCM, ice dope enabled uh, GCM run from Lagrange and Schmidt. Uh, and you can see that the delta ATNO seawater also shows the large-scale patterns that uh, we observed in salinity. And so the question is, how do we get at paleosalinity? And uh, very quickly, I'll let you know that one of the most simple established approaches uh, is to look at foraminifera, planktic foraminifera. And so what I have here is, is this is the living planktic foraminifera. These are how they're uh, uh, shells are once they fall to the seafloor, and we can retrieve uh, their tests or their shells at these places where you can get high resolution sedimentation. So uh, the idea here is that these are, again, planktic foraminifera as opposed to benthic. So the planktic foraminifera live at the top of the uh, uh, water column. And so while they're living and while they're depositing their shell, they lock in the ocean chemistry, the sea surface chemistry, and then that uh, basically sinks, the shell sinks to the floor, and we can go retrieve them and do a whole host of measurements on them. And so one of the ways to uh, target paleosalinity is to measure the stable isotope content, oxygen content, so delta ATNO of these shells, along with a measurement of magnesium calcium ratios. And I'll tell you why this becomes important, because if you measure both of these, we know that the delta HNO of the foraminifera is a function of both the delta HNO of seawater as well as the temperature in which the uh, uh, foraminifera grew in or deposited its shell. But the magnesium calcium ratios is known to be a function solely of temperature or in some areas a function of temperature and a little bit of salinity as well. 
And so if we measure these, and, and of course, like I showed you before, the delta H, you know, seawater is going to be a function of uh, uh, salinity. And on much, much longer time scales, like glacial, interglacial time scales, that is, it's going to vary, uh, it's going to display uh, variations with respect to ice volume, so sea levels over here. But on the whole, we have these three equations, and we do know this relationship in most areas. And so if we measure delta H, you know, and if we measure the magnesium calcium, we can essentially deconvolve and tease out temperature and paleo, paleo temperature and paleo salinity. And we can do this on very high resolution. So for example, uh, right here is some work published by Julie Ritchie. And uh, so this is a high resolution record from the Gulf of Mexico that spans uh, the last 1500 years or so. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, a paper that we recently got published, and uh, uh, let me, well, I can uh, put a link to the paper a little later. In any case, um, what we have is that propagation of error through these uh, equations right here, one, two, and three, is, is nonlinear and it's complex. And so the uncertainty that you might think we get in paleo salinity is very, very large that might limit any sort of inferences about sea surface salinity and, and let alone AMOC variability. But what we uh, provide in this paper is an algorithm which uses uh, a bootstrap methodology that considerably alters uh, uh, sort of the structure of the uncertainty thus far. And it, it, it gives you very easy constraints and sort of uh, much reduced uncertainty estimates. So we can characterize uncertainty really, really well using this sort of methodology. And as you can see over here, um, uh, we can get nice error bars and so forth, and we can do all sorts of testing uh, of statistical significance and, and so on. But the important thing is that we have a pathway and methodology to figure out how uh, past sea surface salinity changes occurred on very high uh, uh, resolution sediments. And many a time, people have investigated just magnesium calcium in foraminifera or just delta ATNO. So a lot of this work can actually um, target revisiting cores where one measurement has been made and one has not. And so you can just, uh, uh, if, you, if you just measure the uh, magnesium calcium in cases where only delta ATNO has been made or vice versa, you can really look at building together composite maps of paleo salinity in, in many areas where you have high resolution sediments. So with that, I'm just going to quickly conclude that salinity is indicative of ocean circulation, and paleo salinity has the potential to constrain past day mass variability. Uh, this sort of paired measurement in foraminifera can be applied to reconstruct paleo salinity, and one way to put all of these disparate things together, uh, including the uncertainties and so forth, is to look at field correlation analysis that can bridge paleo data as well as models. So with that, uh, I'm happy to receive any questions later on, I guess. And uh, if you have any questions about particular methodologies or uh, the algorithms that I've used in this uh, talk or uh, the article, please let me know. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Cal. Great presentation. Um, I don't see any quick clarification questions, so let's go ahead and move on to Al. And we'll take all questions here at the end. So feel free to go ahead and queue those up in the chat function as we get on with our presentation. Hi, everyone. This is Al Wanamaker. Um, I'm out at Iowa State, the great oceanography state. Um, I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this Cliva article, um, Maddie Meddy and Nina Whitney, who are both working um, on this, um, this important uh, issue of overturning circulation. So what I'd like to do is briefly outline some of the potential of um, one particular archive that may help us understand ocean circulation and perhaps overturning circulation. So we work with um, a number of um, you know, biological um, proxies, but probably the most um, useful one is this long-lived marine bivalve known as Arctica Icelandica. Um, and based on its name, it generally likes cooler waters, although I'll show you in a moment that it actually goes down as far south as North Carolina, but it's in real deep water. Um, it's widely distributed across the North Atlantic um, region, and it produces annual increments in its shell 
which can be prostated like they do in dendrochronology, so we can establish absolutely dated chronologies ostensibly with no errors in them, and of course this is, this is important. And we do this because the, the increment uh, widths are generally are synchronous among populations, suggesting that it's an environmental signal that is being propagated into the shell growth. Um, from a geochemical standpoint, there is good evidence that the uh, calcium carbonate um, is deposited in oxygen isotope equilibrium with seawater, which then allows us to make some inferences back about temperature in the delta 18 O of the, the seawater um, and um, get back to essentially hydrography. Uh, here's just a, a schematic uh, up in the left hand corner. Here we have um, a typical um, Arctica Icelandica shell. You can see some of these growth patterns on the surface here, um, and, and unless they're quite young, you really can't distinguish sort of the temporal nature of those. We have to section the shells, um, and what we do is uh, we embed them in a epoxy, as shown down in here, and you have um, half of the shell that we use to do geochemical analyses, and the other half we um, make an acetate peel of that surface, um, and we can then visualize these growth increments in here. And if, if you look at them, there's a lot of variability in there, um, which makes it really nice to cross-date. We use the, the concept of marker years to align them up temporally, um, and so um, that allows us to make sure that we're um, placing each annual increment in the correct calendar year so that we can do um, uh, comparisons with instrumental data and any even lag lead relationships between the marine and terrestrial environment, which we know um, we're all interested in doing. Um, and so once the um, shells are um, uh, visualized and imaged and cross-dated, we'll then go to the other block here and we'll actually micro-mill out the annual increments um, on a little dental drill here, which is commonly used with corals and bivalves. And we'll run that through the mass spectrometer um, and get a, a determination for that particular year, and we can line them all up and start to compare it to um, other records. Let's see here. Okay, here's a here's a map um, of the region of interest. And we've um, put together um, locations where this shell work is, is going on. And what you'll see is that they're in pretty interesting areas um, in, the, in the surface limb of the overturning circulation, um, including the Gulf of Maine um, over this way here, which is at the interface of the warm Atlantic waters traveling northward and the, the Labrador current Labrador-derived water is flowing southward and mixing um, sort of at the interface outside of the Gulf of Maine and mixing in there. We have uh, shell chronologies from Iceland, um, which is seemingly sensitive to um, the, the transport of heat and, and salt uh, northward, and along here in uh, the UK region and up into Scandinavia at the end of the North Atlantic current. Um, Matty Meddy is working on a site way up here in the north, and we heard Hallie talking about uh, better understanding the impacts of AMB in high latitudes or, or AMOC in the high latitudes, and so she's working on that. And Nina Whitney is continuing work that we started a while ago now in the Gulf of Maine. Um, but what you can see here is we have the potential now to um, go beyond just um, one more dot in the ocean and we can start to bring together these chronologies, much like they do in tree ring science, and make a network. And I would say that's where most of the effort in, in the scleral chronology community is, is to start combining these um, chronologies, uh, growth records, and isotopes in intelligent ways, and in that um, it gives us some indication of the spatial variability in the, in the ocean uh, current network. Okay, here's one example from uh, the article that we um, contributed here for U.S. Clivar variations. It's, it's, um, it's a master shell chronology from the Gulf of Maine. Um, it is 
a little over 250 years. It includes about 32 different shells. Each of those are shown here in different colors. And um, the, the growth trend has been removed like you have to do uh, for trees because they grow more quickly when they're young and they grow more slowly when they're older, so you have to remove that. And unfortunately, this process removes a little bit of the low frequency variability. And we're plagued with the same problem um, that dendrochronology has is that some of the low or a lot of the low frequency variation that we'd like to have is lost. However, we can gain that back when we add in uh, isotopes. Um, so this then becomes the template for doing our work. Um, we could, you know, if a new geochemical measurement comes up that we haven't worked on yet, we can go back to the material and go back to an individual year. But what, what you can see here clearly is that there is quite a lot of synchronous variability um, and this big growth spurt here and then it comes down and there is multi-decadal variability in here. And each of the individual shells is, is essentially archiving that information. And at this site, it, it's very much likely related to the quality of the food and the temperature and the degree of stratification that's going on there. We, um, we have compared these data now to some instrumental um, data nearby. So the panel on the left is showing the deep trended growth increments versus seawater temperature um, at minus eight meters at a nearby uh, instrument uh, station just about 14 kilometers away. And you can see there's quite a bit of coherence between the, uh, the, how much the individual shells grow in a given year with uh, seawater temperature. Interestingly, it is an inverse relationship. And we think it's because these are really cold water clams and now the Gulf of Maine is getting upwards of 16 degrees Celsius in the summertime. So they have a, a, a growth optimum around 10 degrees Celsius. So if it's a cool year, um, they are using less energy to grow. They're probably getting um, more food because stratification would be less in colder years and they seem to grow a little bit more when it's colder. Um, we also, uh, for the sake of um, this webinar and the conference, we've been looking at some of the larger scale um, ocean dynamics in the region and we compared it to the Florida Current Transport, which is, um, you know, it's about 20 or so years um, of data based on uh, cables um, in, in Florida estimating the total transport. And you can see here in the right panel that we have a pretty decent a uh, positive relationship with the, um, the Florida current transport. And um, we're really excited about this, but we're equally nervous because we also just have one location right now and we'd like to build that spatial network. Um, just a quick note, you might say, well, if growth um, happens, there's more growth in a cold year, um, then why is it positively correlated with Florida current transport? Well, recent um, work, um, mostly led by Terry Joyce um, and colleagues at Woods Hole, showed that when the Gulf Stream intensifies, it moves offshore a little bit. And so that causes um, more of the cold Labrador water to come down along the shelf and fill up the Gulf of Maine. And so it's not very intuitive, um, but it is consistent with the data that we're developing now. And so we have a regional response here in the bottom left um, hand corner and we have a, a sort of a larger scale um, pattern out here um, relating to the Florida current. And Hallie early on said one of the, the important things we walked away from the meeting is that the, the entire uh, AMOC is a massive animal and it's unlikely that we're going to reconstruct all of it. However, if our proxy data can give us information about some aspect of it where the dynamical link is clear, that is a big step forward. And so I think, um, especially with these Arctica shells, we'll be able to do that in some key locations. I just wanted to highlight um, when you add isotopes to this, so again, that same uh, group of data um, for the growth increments are up on top, and now we have isotopes over that time period here, and you can see it preserves very nicely the, the low frequency, and then when you regress those isotopes against the very long Booth Bay Harbor sea surface temperature record um, shown here in red, we get a very coherent uh, match there, which has given us some indication that especially the isotopes are, are recording hydrography. 
And uh, just real quickly, this is a, um, a spatial correlation map um, of the isotopes from 1872 to 2013 against the Hadley SST record, showing that there is a coherence um, in that through time. And on the right is a biplot of the, the, the local SSTs versus the isotopes showing um, that um, relationship holds up. So again, we can very strategically now go to locations in the ocean where these um, clams live and start to think about how we can develop and improve the spatial network and extend it back in time. Um, we've done that uh, up in the North Icelandic shelf. Um, uh, Paul Butler has uh, essentially created uh, a 1,200 year uh, shell chronology from the North Icelandic shelf and the individual shells are on the top, and then when you bring those all together and detrend the, the, the ontogenetic growth trend, you get this, this variable uh, growth uh, chart through time. And um, the, the, the most exciting part of this is that David Reynolds has um, produced um, an annual oxygen isotope record and that will be uh, coming out in publication uh, fairly soon here. So we will have essentially a millennial uh, scale length isotope record from Iceland and look at North Atlantic variability. I think you'll find it pretty exciting. Okay, and then as Helly mentioned before that we can in fact use the radiocarbon signature that is um, in the seawater and as it gets archived into the the, um, the framework of these calcium carbonate organisms, essentially it's a tracer of water mass. And a, a little bit earlier um, up in Iceland, we did a radiocarbon um, analysis of, of shells that were absolutely dated through time. And what we showed is that there, there was a bit, of, uh, a, a bit more um, of Atlantic water up on the North Icelandic shelf in, in sort of the early medieval times, and that seemed to decrease uh, through time and into the Little Ice Age, and maybe there was a slight increase in modern times, but this, these data stopped in 1950, so that's a little bit hard to evaluate. So it does indicate that there's um, some shifting uh, of the surface currents up there, whether that's a record that is um, only related to the subpolar gyre or North Iceland is to be determined as we roll out more records. But it does give some insight into the different techniques that we can use. And certainly, given enough resources, we could increase the resolution of, of this type of record. So um, in um, considering the time, I think I'll, I'll stop there and move us along um, to a slide over here and, and take any questions afterwards. Great. Thanks, Al. Allie, did you want to wrap up with kind of the final recommendation? A 30-second wrap up with the recommendations. So, so I just wanted to, to point out the, that um, coming out of the workshop, we, um, we came up with sort of four basic recommendations. Um, and that was a consistent framework between models and observations. So we have, we have issues that we are um, not always talking about the same variable. So as been mentioned in the last hour, trying to make sure that there is um, a strong dynamic link for our paleo reconstructions, and also that, that we understand what the data, the variability in our data mean for uh, meridional overturning -circul circulation and, and the actual stream function that many modelers are actually using. Um, so then um, another, another aspect is, is a denser framework of, of variables. We, we don't have enough data yet to really answer the questions we're asking. Um, and, and we need, like, like uh, Al said, a network so that we, we know we're not just doing a site um, and, and we, have, we have a good spatial understanding of the spatial variability. Um, number three was improved understanding and communication of uncertainties. It came up in everything that we were discussing from model uncertainty, reanalysis uncertainty, to proxy uncertainty. Um, and then uh, the fourth recommendation uh, is to encourage coordin better coordination between scientific communities, whether it's 
CMIP and PMIP and the paleo uh, proxy community with modeling communities, both paleo and modern, um, and just simply the modern climate and paleo climate communities. There's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of times the data and and studies that we do are have implications for each other that we're not always aware of, and um, often relatively small changes to our experimental designs, our our our, our protocols could actually make the information that we get um, more usable for, for others. So just um, encouraging uh, communication at both a personal level but also at more of the, the institutional level where um, their, uh, in, uh, institutions like CLIVAR can, can help and institutions like PAGES can help foster more communication um, amongst the communities. So that's that's the end. Those are the basic recommendations, and um, I, I'd love to to uh, address any questions or start start this the question and answer. Great, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Al, and thanks, Cal. Really great presentations. We do have time for Q and A. So, if anyone who is tuned in would like to type in your question, go ahead and do that now. And as I mentioned before, you can also raise your hand. So. I think there's a little raise hand button right in the center of your screen. You can click that and I will take you off mute. And if you didn't see, CalSub placed a couple links uh, to some of the papers that were mentioned, um, both in his presentation as well as in Alan's presentation in the chat box. And those should be able to open up into new windows for you. Holly, I have a question, and, and maybe you can answer this for some of the others. You know, I was at the workshop, and I just, you know, re thinking about your recommendations. Do you have anything specific that you think we should act on as kind of a next step? You know, based on the activities and the discussions at the workshop. We, you know, we've done this variations article, but kind of, is there any concrete next steps that you think would really help as far as kind of merging the paleo and the modern communities that we're kind of making momentum in? Um. I, I think a a major next step is is proposal submissions. <laughs> um, I think a lot of informal collaborations were were formed at the meeting, um, and and I think that a lot of there was a big I, a, a whole bunch of idea exchanges, and so I think in the next few rounds of of um, grant proposals coming in to various agencies, I think there's going to be um, hopefully, a, a, a sort of critical mass of, of uh, uh, proposals on this topic. Um, I know actually one one thing that I had actually spoken with um, uh, a couple of people about is actually trying to do um, a, a more co internationally coordinated effort on uh, paleo AMOC reconstructions. Um, and that I would like to see um, see moving forward because there's a lot of – one thing that, that came out for me uh, in this workshop was that there's a lot of uh, work being done um, in Europe, the projects that are funded right now and, and ongoing that um, that uh, not all American researchers have been aware of. And so that trying to coordinate the efforts um, internationally a little bit more um, could be a good way of, of moving forward. Great. Thank you. 